Yeah, it's my great pleasure to announce our guest speaker um, today, who is like now a virtual guest speaker, but he will actually soon be an actual speaker. He will come around in December. Um, so our guest is uh, Jacob, or should I say Jakob, you decide, Kotman. Whatever you prefer. Um, from the Alan team in Toronto. Um, but actually having lots of overlap in, in, in many ways with our group in terms of topics, but also biographically, because well, topic-wise, he's interested in near-term quantum computing in many readings and ramifications biographically, because he's actually also from Berlin. Um, and he has worked in chemistry in Berlin, in quantum chemistry, before moving to the Alan Asporiguzi group in Toronto, thinking about lots of well, questions of quantum chemistry, but quantum computing inspired thinking of new variants of quantum eigensolvers like meta variational quantum eigensolvers, several readings of noisy intermediate scale quantum algorithms in, in, in many forms and, and, and flavors. The idea of quantum computer aided design of quantum optics hardware um, is an idea that also came out of that context. That's an idea that also, Johannes Meyer and um, Johannes Beauregard and myself have picked up in a slightly different context, but that was quite inspirational for us. Um, or more quantum algorithms inspired work like quantum computations on eigenvalues within target intervals or more quantum chemistry um, motivated work on, on coupled clusters. So today, we will hear about one and many body aspects of quantum chemistry. So thanks for coming. And uh, I don't want to waste any more time from your talk. So thanks again. And the stage is all yours. OK, thank you very much for the introduction and also for the invitation. Um, let me share my screen first. And this should work out on full screen now, I guess. That's wonderful. OK, yeah. great. Um, so I think the audience today is actually larger than in some conferences that are currently online. So this is quite cool for me. Also, like, I, I assume that not all of you are have a background in quantum chemistry. But so I assume a, a well educated audience, but probably not not familiar like with the acronyms and uh, special things. But like still, if I'm using them too much, uh, feel free to interrupt me and we can discuss like what's behind a specific uh, slang word. But I'm, I'm trying to get around them a little bit. OK, um, in that sense, uh, let's just start. Um, and I would like with the start um, in quantum chemistry, what are we actually trying to achieve? Or in another question, what would a, a chemist, which actually works in a laboratory, would want from a quantum chemist? And usually the, the chemists I talk to, um, when, I, when I like ask them, uh, what do you want from us? And they say, we want a device or a program or whatever that if we feed it a molecule, it gives us back an energy. And then I usually ask like, we, we can give you that already, but then they say like, we want it, we want it to be the, the right energy. Or at least- I'm Sorry, I, I, the, there's lots of noise. Is that on, from your side uh, uh, or is that from somebody else's side? I think that's from Marcus. Okay. Um, Let's see, let me see. Um... Sorry, I just muted. I didn't okay. realize. Yeah, sorry. Mm -hmm. Sorry about this. Yeah, sorry. Um, all good. OK. Um, yeah, by the way, I sometimes I have this bad habit that I put my hands sometimes on the laptop. And if it's on the microphone, also like, just let me know. I'm trying to avoid this. OK. Um, so like, usually, this is what, what people want. And this is hard to achieve, but there are at least some ways forward in order to do this. And like the whole field is basically trying to achieve this for the, uh, since the field existed basically. So if we lift the black box a little bit of how we can achieve this, this is then something you are probably all familiar <laughs> with. Um, first of all, what is the molecule? In that case, this is really just a collection of coordinates and charges. So it's a, it's a bunch of point charges that are the nuclei. They are not treated as actual quantum particles here. So this is your input, uh, number of coordinates and charges. And then we're trying to use quantum physics in order to answer the question of what the energy of this object is. So these coordinates and charges, they give you the Coulomb interaction in which the electrons move. 
And this defines then your so-called real space Hamiltonian, which is just a giant Hamiltonian of this many electron system that is the molecule. In this case, this has nine three-dimensional coordinates. And this is just the case because this is the water molecule here. And this has, uh, so it's actually 10, so like zero to nine. And this has 10 electrons. So every electron has a, has a coordinate and you have a very high dimensional function, which you need to tackle. And our energy is now the eigen energy of this operator and ideally the lowest one, so the ground state. The problem is now that these operators, they are way too high dimensional that we can just brute force solve this equation. So what we need to do, we need to discretize the Hamiltonian itself and also the space in which the electrons are moving. So somehow we need to handle um, the three-dimensional continuous space, but then we also need to add some kind of a wave function model in order to restrict the representation of wave functions that we allow so that we can tackle this problem algorithmically. And continuing here, this is how reality looks like currently. Can I already ask a question about this? Um, yeah, of course, of course. Uh, so, I mean, of course, there's like first and second quantized oh, ansatzes and like the literature explodes okay. on versions of of, of, of numerical methods that would tackle the problem in the second quantized picture, given some orbitals that you have. But a problem that's often overlooked is like finding good orbitals in the first place. I mean, I'm sure that's not overlooked in Alan's group by no means, but um, will you say more about this? And like what you precisely mean by the wave function model? Is that something, is that the point of the rest of your talk? Or is this a good moment well, to discuss this a bit? In the next slides, we're going down the, the orbital route and then okay, in the end a bit for the wave function model. Um, but Which, this is, so like you, you anticipated it already. Oh, no, sorry, no, yeah. I didn't want to take anything uh, away. I just, no, that's, that, that's completely fine. Um, so okay. it was a very generalized picture. You somehow have to discretize. Either you take a, a second quantized approach by using these orbitals. You could also take a grid-based approach. You can also try to tackle the, the partial differential equation directly if you are somehow able to resolve a very large grid. There are also methods, for example, um, in Berlin from Frank Noé, who are trying uh, a neural network type approaches in order to tackle this high dimensional function. But in, in some way, it always has to be kind of discretized. Um, and if you look at the reality, like apart from uh, these, some of these more uh, new and more fancy methods that I just mentioned, but what's actually the reality in a chemistry lab, what do we have access to? It usually results down to, you can actually use a black box algorithm that gives you an energy back, but you have to pick at least two things as the chemist who operates this. You have to pick a wave function model, which basically means you have to pick one of these acronyms here, and you have to pick a discretization method. And these are all so-called second quantized orbital methods, which each of these acronyms is a predefined set of functions that are placed on top of the atoms. So, and I think this relates a little bit about what uh, Jens was saying before, um, that this is one of the problem, like how to find good orbitals, so to say. Once you pick such an acronym, you can never operate out of this space that these orbitals span. And in reality, for a chemist, this is usually a problem because um, if I would work in a chemistry lab and I would be interested in finding new ways of synthesis, I would definitely not be interested in learning what these acronyms are and also learning to guess uh, how good they are and like which one to pick for which molecule for which property. And so <clears throat> if you go a little bit back of how these discretization basically works is you're taking the n-body problem uh, here as a cartoonish example, it's just a two-body Hamiltonian, but you can, you can view it like in your mind as a, as a two-dimensional problem, like you have two coordinates, two kinetic energies, one interaction between these fictional one-dimensional particles, and they both are moving in a potential. And in the chemistry case, this potential is this potential spanned up by the nuclear charges. Um, now you can formulate out of this n-body problem, you can formulate effective one or maybe also two body problems, which you can tackle also by fairly brute force methods. And what it usually means, if you take an effective one body approach, you're taking your, instead of solving an n body problem, a correlated one, you're solving now coupled 
one body problems and coupled one body problems, so to say. And uh, the most prominent example is the so-called Hartley Fock, or also sometimes just called as mean field approach. <clears throat> and this determines your orbitals. But if you are using such a predefined set, this actually just determines your orbitals within that set. So like you are optimizing linear expansion coefficients in a before predefined set. But still, after you have done this, you can take these orbitals, so to say, and move them to a second quantized picture, which you could then also map to a quantum computer. But of course, you can also take classical methods in order to tackle this afterwards. Well, it's really, but a, a, a question on this, like, I mean, in, in, in this picture, like for a given set of orbitals, the, um, the, the kind of the variation principle that you would have on the right hand side would basically one of like Gaussian states over free fermions expressed in terms of the orbitals that you've specified beforehand, right? So that's a, a, a setting that's not very commonly stated, but um, because one always thinks in first quantized terms, but it would still be a true statement, right? Yeah. That should still be true. Good. Yeah. Um, and another way, if you pick one of these acronyms, you have fixed your discrete space already. And everything you're doing here on the left hand side is you're getting a better starting point here for your many body uh, approach. But you can never increase the accuracy of your discretization at this point. At this point, it's just fixed. Um, and now, this is a cartoon again, like how the traditional approach works. These are these so-called predefined basis sets here. So you're trying to capture the one body space in which a single electron can move. Um, you're putting some predefined functions in, so you're fixing this. And then you're doing, you can do some pre-optimization on this in order to get a better starting point. But by throwing these predefined functions in, you have already fixed the space you're operating in. And there are of course advantages to this. And the two biggest ones are, this is a well-established Thing. there's a large part of classical machinery that can do this, compute you the necessary integrals. And these integrals are also very fast because most of these basis sets use Gaussian functions. And for all of these, the integrals are there analytically and you have all kinds of computational tricks in order to speed that up. The drawbacks are all from a, from a user perspective. So it's not a black box procedure. Like you have to pick one of these acronyms and you have to pick the right one. Otherwise you're lost, you have no you have no way of improving upon that. It can be quite inconvenient because these acronyms are actually defined for every atom. So every atom has all of these acronyms. In principle, you could also combine it. Um, if you look at it from a quantum perspective, if you want to be accurate, you need more qubits because you need more of these, uh, more of these functions in order to be on the safe side accuracy-wise. This is if you want to claim the so-called chemical accuracy of three digits beyond the decimal point. You should also have that in your numerical representation. And the largest drawback is that the, the numerical error you make is undetermined. So you don't know it. Like you have to, you have to pick and you have to, you have to have faith that this is, uh, this is accurate enough. Mm -hmm. I see. Uh, um, uh, sorry, I, I don't want to be too annoying. Am I also- No, 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 all, all good. I, I will keep questions low, but- um, so when you say um, the, you have all these acronyms per atom, sure. I know, I'm, I'm sure that each acronym is like an industry of things. I mean, I've, <laughs> I've been at conference of this type where like somebody had some variation there of and was like citing papers like with 100,000 citations and so on. He's like, uh, quite big. But my actual point is that um, you're basically uh, um, in this context requiring that you have a, a, a product ansatz that each atom has its own set of orbitals because you can easily think of even on the in the in the first quantized level of orbitals that are not kind of like specifying the the the, the atom but are like global involving many atoms at the same time like even hybrid orbitals of some type would be of that type but you're excluding this right so you really have atoms per uh, orbitals per atom here yes it's, it's it's basically on every atom you place these functions, which type of functions you place there is specified by these acronyms, which is actually each of these acronyms is actually a whole family of acronyms here. And these are the functions you then have, and you have to express everything in those functions. But of course you can have something like molecular orbitals, which are not on atom by doing linear combinations of these atomic orbitals. Mm -hmm. So it has a, it has a physical background and it's, it's also, um, 
it's also not a bad approach. It's just if you want to be accurate, it's hard to pick the right family of functions to put on a specific atom. Oh, yeah, yeah. I'm not surprised. Okay. Um, I would actually say um, I have experience with this. I have done a lot of calculations, but I couldn't tell you if you would ask me for a specific molecule, which acronym to pick. Okay. I would just be pick the largest one you can get. Um, Sorry, I also have a question. Uh, uh, so you, you you mentioned that uh, as the first step you choose which are the basis uh, the, the the basis states that you are using they are predefined, but if I understand correctly uh, a priori this basis set is infinite right infinite dimensional because already for the single uh, particle uh, uh, problem you have an infinite set of states so you have to to apply some truncation first. Uh, yes, exactly. Which is not yeah. the case uh, that that we have in uh, spin chains, for example, where the local Hilbert space is finite dimensional. Yes, exactly. That that's 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 the full point where you have to do like why the discretization part always comes in because you have to tackle that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Um, so so if I understand correctly, you 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 need to have a, a first guess of of. Uh, uh, of of uh, which states out of the infinite set of uh, eigenstates are the most uh, relevant ones, and the quality of the end result is uh, it depends on the initial guess, right? Yes, exactly. Yeah. Okay. So if if you take this initial guess, so to say, you fix this representation here. As so like basically, you're throwing a bunch of of functions onto this molecule. Then you can do basically an exact diagonalization of your of your discretized Hamiltonian that you get. And this is the most accurate energy then you can get within that decision that you have made before. Mm -hmm. And if some functions which should be crucial for the energy are missing, you cannot, you cannot get that, yeah. It's, the, 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 it's, it's, it's completely that, yeah. Mm -hmm. So if you would put like an infinite amount of functions of on each atom, which are like proportional to hydrogenic type systems then you would be good of course yeah um but but you cannot do this uh, so um an alternative to this is uh if we would say can we use something that is more flexible that is not static that we throw a bunch of functions at the problem which can never change and there are approaches which allow you to do this and <clears throat> Oh, I wanted to repeat this here because I thought there might be questions about the acronym, um, but we can skip this. So this is the different approach, so to say, one uh, that we tried where we're using a flexible way of representing uh, three-dimensional functions. And in this case, this is the so-called multi-resolution analysis. And I have a, a few cartoons in the next slide what, what, how this more or less works. But you can think about it as an adaptive system that is able to, to represent any type of three-dimensional function that you like. If you're using something like this, um, you need to tell the adaptive system basically which functions you want from it. So, at this point, something like a surrogate potential enters the game. And you can, for example, think about uh, Hartree-Fock again, which we talked before, for example, the mean field. If you have a fixed basis and later, for example, you're doing exact diagonalization, the mean field would not change the result of this exact diagonalization. If you're doing some other things like coupled cluster, the mean field does change this because you're changing the starting point of this more local expansion of the many-body wave function. So you're doing a pre-optimization, so to say. In this case here, the mean field actually determines which type of orbitals you want to be represented. So in this case, you're taking the effective one-body potential and tell the system here, I want the exact representation of the solution of this model problem. And then you're taking these orbitals in order to expand in the, in the many-body picture later. And the advantage that you have here is that this is different for every molecule. So like these, through these potentials, these orbitals will adapt to the molecular structure. It's not a predefined set of functions anymore. And the discretization error that you make has a physical reason because the discretization error here is then determined by the surrogate potential. And this makes it easier to analyze, at least if you have a physical background, if this is sufficient or not for the system you are interested in. Um, so in a way, the advantages and drawbacks, they kind of flip, 
like all of a sudden, this is not very well established and it has comparatively high classical computational cost. Although I have to say the formal scaling, if you're using a representation like this, is almost in all cases better than the fixed basis counterpart, but the, the computational prefactor is high. So it means they are not as established and not as standardized as the other methods, but it's a way out of this dilemma um, that you have, can have in principle an accuracy that can adapt to your system of interest. Um, and what I mean with uh, a physical reason for your discretization error, so what we are, for example, using, we're using a mean field method, but we are also using, a, a, on top of that, we're using a little bit of perturbation theory in order to capture the many body correlations a little bit and feed this information into the determination of the orbitals. In this perturbation theory, we get occupation numbers back. And we know then if the occupation numbers are very high, we know that the perturbation is high. And then we know that our original approach of taking mean field plus perturbation was potentially not the best idea. And we would probably need something more accurate or we need to refine these functions further. But at least you have, a, you have like a physically interpretable feedback that you can use as a criterion if you are good or not to, concerning your discretization. Um, but since you're probably interested on a high level, like how this technique here works, um, one thing I have to say before, this technique basically works as a black box. You can in principle ignore everything that the machinery does and just work at a very high level and give it basically the defining equations and say like, this is my integral equation, which I want to have solved. This is how my potential looks. And you can basically give it to the code in the same way as writing it on a blackboard. And the code I'm speaking about is so-called, the code name is Madness. This is a numerical framework in order to use these multi-resolution approaches, which is, uh, was created by Robert Harrison. And how this works is the following. It's a wavelet-based scheme that resolves spatial space adaptively. So here's a small example of a one-dimensional function, which is this black, black function here. And if I would now say we can use um, step functions which have finite support in order to represent this. And what you can always do, you can increase resolution by splitting the interval into half and then you have two intervals left. These you can split into half again and you can half that. So you get something like a tree structure here which carries the coefficients of step functions that have support in that area in that area of spatial space. And of course, this is not a very good representation here, but I wanted to avoid to have the cartoon here be too, too refined, but you can probably think about, you can now split this, this, this again. So like the tree uh, gets deeper. And if you do this, you get closer and closer to your original function. And this is how madness works, just that it's not one dimensional, it's up to one or six spatial dimensions. And it's just that it doesn't just use step functions, it also uses, in principle, each of these boxes is filled with uh, piecewise polynomials instead of just a step function. Uh, but um, I mean, as just as a um, like side remark, question, whatever you like it. I mean, this would work whenever you have the issue of having like a set of orbitals. So that could be interfaced with uh, DFT, with tensor networks, what not, right? So, I mean, and, exactly, and yeah, quantum yeah. variation algorithms for that matter, but this would equally work for, well, to name two tensor networks and um, like DFT, where you like look for this kind of self-consistent approach, but as a subroutine, you would have to call things like that. Yeah, yeah, that, this is completely right. Um, this was actually, this was the first application of this was DFT, because at that point, that was, that's a, a one body model. Um, where they could also get to fairly high uh, uh, molecules. Yeah, and this, basically the difference is in this surrogating potential, so to say, then you use like the, the Kohn-Sham equations and then you're good, then you can do DFT. Yeah, in the Kohn-Sham setting, so that's, this, this goes in. Okay, yeah, thank you. Um, and so, yeah, in, in principle, uh, what you need to do in order to define orbitals, you need a three-dimensional representation. It works exactly the same. Like here's a two-dimensional cartoon, fairly similar function. And this is like the refined grid that you get. And each of these boxes is filled with a piecewise polynomial that represents this. Um, 
And this is um, how we can, for example, then solve uh, this effective one or two body problems uh, in the classical domain in order to um, compute orbitals. And what we did at some point, like this is how the whole thing started back in Berlin, there we were actually focused on the direct two body approach, which means like we, we took models like uh, approximations to couple cluster single doubles and try to solve that directly. So instead of having orbitals, we're solving for electronic pair functions directly on a six dimensional spatial grid. Um, this direction works, but at this point you like, you experience that you go to the limit of what these methods can achieve. And so the, the other way, which I showed you before with the surrogate potential is like, you don't go to the direct resolution. You always stay in the one body picture and you're trying to determine orbitals, which are the best for a given classically feasible surrogate model in order to de determine the orbitals you want. Um, and this is what we did, and we tried it uh, in combination with the variational quantum eigensolver. And this is just a, a small like ballpark table of, if you think about in qubits, like each orbital gets mapped to a qubit or each spin orbital gets mapped to a qubit, how many qubits would you need to get the comparable accuracy if you compare traditional fixed basis sets, the so-called Gaussian basis sets, uh, with this system adaptive approach by using this multi-resolution analysis plus a surrogating potential. And we did different chemical systems. And here we, are, we restricted ourselves to chemical systems where we know that we can solve the many body, uh, the many body part exactly without too much of a hassle. Um, and then we also looked at different energy metrics. So fact, for example, the maximum error on a potential energy surface or the so-called non-parallelity error, which is the difference between the maximum and the minimum error. And this is kind of a criteria of how well balanced uh, your method is in the whole range of the energy surface where the molecule uh, moves and also like some small reaction energies. And here you see like one specific example of a beryllium dihydride where we stretch the two uh, bonds here. So like we change the distance of these nuclei and see the corresponding energies. In red, you see what you get if you take one of these standardized basis sets and take the smallest one so that you have a, a 12 qubit representation afterwards. And then red and yellow, you see the same thing here if we take the system adapted approach and optimize six orbitals so that we also have a 12 qubit system afterwards. And you see the difference that you have in energy here is quite large actually. And now these numbers here tell you if you use larger basis sets, how large do they need to be in order to get the same accuracy? And they're always between two numbers because these basis sets, they just come in, in like discretized forms. So like you can either do a 46 qubit and then you are slightly worse, or you can do the next one is then 114 and then you are better, so to say. And this is, for example, this is the, our reference that we took, which would correspond to a 200 qubit uh, representation of your Hamiltonian. Um, um, if you're interested more, like we, we tried to write a high level blog article about it once uh, where we basically tried to explain the same things that I, that I did before, but like uh, in written form and with different pictures. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so this is the discretization part. Now we have the wave function models. Like we can use this with a surrogating potential. Um, we can see if the, if the occupation numbers we get there are fine. And if we're happy with this, we can take this discretization, formulate our qubit Hamiltonian, and now try to come up with a wave function model um, that gives us a good state in the many body picture. And one way forward here also in order to achieve this automatized stream that you can at some point use it as a black box is for example, using quantum circuits or quantum algorithms in general. So you could think about you doing a small variational approach where you use physical principles to automatically design a circuit. You could think about of adaptively expanding this. There are also some approaches in that direction. And of course, in the end, you could do something like a phase estimation where you then try to collapse into the right eigenstates at the end um, with fairly high probability. And that could in principle work as a black box model at some point. Um, so the variational task here, um, just a small overview, but I, I think actually 
probably all of you are familiar with this. Like you're taking a quantum circuit, uh, it's all basically each small operation that you do is a small time evolution and this time or sometimes also called an angle you can of course tune and if you can differentiate this you can automatically like get the gradients and like uh, try to use gradient descent in order to get the best possible approximation to your wave function with the it's also a kind of a discretization with the circuit that you that you are using and by automatic differentiation you mean like estimating gradients from data because um People complain a lot that you need a lot of measurements, right, to, to get great hits <clears throat> at the end of the day, right? So that's something. Yes, this is also like, this is something that I usually, that I often ignore, um, that you need a lot of measurements. Because like, if you, if you simulate it uh, on a simulator, that's, you don't, you don't see the problem so much. But it's actually an issue, yeah. Also, mm -hmm. the, the sensitivity is, is larger if you have than a real device, because you have to do the difference of two numbers. Sure. Mm -hmm. um, that's that's definitely true. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. But okay. From a from a high level picture, in principle, you could do something like this. Um, and there are like uh, also many libraries. For example, Penny Lane. But I think now nowadays also like most of the of the standard libraries from the companies have this ability that they have this differentiability. So um, that gives you a nice playing ground in order to test out new ideas. And we started to do something similar with first with a focus on quantum chemistry, but now it's uh, it's a bit more general. So like the different routes uh, than uh, comparable packages, um, which was the so-called uh, tequila package. That's a high level environment in order to automatize such systems. So like you can define Hamiltonians circuits in principle these Hamiltonians can also define the circuits as the generator of the time evolution so like you can combine these blocks so to say you can tie them together to expectation values and those you can combine in any ways you like in order to get the so-called objective functions um and we have a small example in a second um and the Overall idea behind this was that we can deploy, develop, and test like new ideas that we potentially have in a very high level fashion. So like ideally the code should look the same as uh, equations you write on a blackboard. And I think I said the exact same sentence uh, a few minutes ago when I, when I talked about the Madness Library and this is also what heavily inspired this, um, this original idea by Robert Harrison to abstract numerical details away from the user that you can really think about the physics on top. Although in this field here, it's often also, uh, it's very useful to open the black box, so to say, and go into the more technical details, especially if you have some ideas of how to make things faster inside that box. Um, and this is just a small um, example of how the, the principles of the API work on top. So like these objectives here are the main object that you are using. There are abstract objects that hold a list of expectation values, which are also abstract objects. Like at this point, this is just a collection of symbols. And they also have a some function, which we call a transformation. And this is a function that the expectation value list is fed into after the evaluation. Now you can take those things and combine them. For example, you can add them, subtract, multiply, divide, uh, take powers of each other, or you can differentiate them or transform them with abstract functions. And you get the same type of data structure back. So like the data structure is always the same, um, which was the goal to make it flexible that you can combine these things however you want. And these uh, examples are often like more intuitive than um, these abstract perspectives. So this would be an example of how the high level code would look like you create a small quantum circuit, you create some Hamiltonians, you combine this to expectation values, and then you have objective structure. So you could form something by just adding the two together, then you can do another one by uh, scaling one of those and then taking the square and then the, the third one is taking the first and taking the second as an exponent. And how would that look as a data structure? That's your first objective, which you create here. This is just the sum of two expectation values. So the list has the two expectation values and the transformation is just a, a function which sums them together. 
The second here, same thing. You just have one expectation value. The transformation is exactly that formula here, like then carried by this object. And if you then call this operation, it forms you like a new objective. So now it has three expectation values and this is your transformation. So basically it keeps track of the computational graph of these uh, transformations and then keeps track of what should happen with those expectation values once they are evaluated. And this is basically what happens if you send this to a simulator or for example, to a cloud quantum computer. These expect expectation values get evaluated there, they get sent back and then they get fed into the transformation. And yeah, the same way if you do gradients, it uses these uh, shift rules and this has then the same structure. Then you have also like two different expectation values and they are subtracted afterwards. Um, and this is one of the examples of what you could think about, like you define a Hamiltonian like this and a circuit like this, which has a parameterized gate, parameterized gate that is just a simple rotation. And then you could say, I want the expectation value of this operator here with respect to this circuit plus the exponential of the negative of the gradient of that expectation value to the square. That's not something you, that's just like gibberish basically, where it's, it's just an example of what you could do. This is how this function would look like if you evaluate it with respect to this parameter A here. And this is how the code looks like in order to, um, to create that. And that was, so the whole motivation behind this was that it's easy to create these type of structures. So like you could think about it, you meet in a seminar room, you have discussions on the blackboard, you have new ideas and you wanna, you wanna just test them numerically first and see what gets out because sometimes you also get the feedback that you, you missed some crucial points or like uh, this thing actually doesn't do what you think it does. And then it's fairly easy in order to do this. And we also did this uh, in our group over the last years a lot that we could just uh, try things out with this uh, technology. And in the next slides, I have a few examples of how we, we used it and what we did, um, but um, we already have 40 minutes. So like I can show you these or like if you're interested in some in particular, we can also discuss more with this, but at some point, if you say we should stop the talk and have a general discussion, just uh, let me know. Um, otherwise I would just uh, click through them. I think I have two examples. I mean, yeah, yeah show, show them a bit. I mean, like, I, I, I think that's, it, it, it's good to see them. Um, and also with this, I tried to be like very high level because here I really, I tried to focus on the original idea that we had and then that we can abstract away the details, so to say. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, so the first was um, um, gradients for quantum chemistry. And this was, how did, how did this, this project like come to life? We had the tequila framework. So we developed, uh, since we wanted to go into the direction of quantum chemistry, we developed some methods there and like did some numerical tests. And by doing those numerical tests, we like realized it's nice to have this automatically differentiable scheme um, and it works very well, but it takes ages to compute the gradients because if you do, for example, these coupled cluster methods where you have to do fermionic excitations, if you encode them into qubits, they get split up into a lot of like different primitive gates. And these primitive gates, they don't know anymore that they act as a collective rotation in some subspace of our many body space. So if you differentiate them, each of them needs to be evaluated twice. And that means if you take an N electron excitation, all of a sudden you have to evalu evaluate two to the power of two N expectation values to get the gradient. I see, and so I mean, there's the, 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 the estimation problem, but on top of that, it's just many, uh, parameters you need to estimate for this. Exactly, and I wanted to say at this point, we didn't even think about the, the, the things you mentioned before that you have on a real device, you have to do a lot of measurement for each expectation value and you probably also have shot noise and all these things. So the problems you have for gradients, then they also amplify because you have to do a lot of them and each of them have these errors within. But it was a truly practical thing. Like on a simulator, we realized evaluating the energy is super large. Why does the optimization take so long? And it was because of that. And so we thought the problem is we are losing all this information here basically by encoding into qubits and then doing this automatic differentiation. If we pull the gradient compilation up one more level and do it before we map to the qubits and decompose into gates, we can exploit that structure. And the structure is basically that these fermionic excitations, they behave like rotations, 
but in a subspace, not in the full space. So it's a little bit more complicated than a, a general like qubit rotation, but you can you can use a similar framework and you, you end up with something that is that is very close to the original shift rule. You just do it at this level, basically. And since we had this framework, we could now focus entirely on this aspect and just plug it in. And since we also had the framework working before that, then it's fairly easy to debug. You can just see if the gradients are the same in the end. And then it's just faster and it like made a lot of the projects that we are doing, like we saved a lot of computational time. I mean, this also costs money. Like if you if you rent clusters, it's often overlooked. Um, and yeah, the nice thing is that these, these tricks that we use in order like to pull the, the compilation to a higher level, this is of course not, this is not restricted to fermionic excitations. This was just the, the case where we really needed it and where we like realized, oh no, we need this. And this inspired like uh, already some follow-ups which did like similar things, also tried to generalize these gradient estimation rules more. Um, where like Arthur Ismailov is actually, he's like a chemist in, York, in Toronto, which is literally next door. And then he did this for more general structure when he said, this is not just a fermionic excitation, but some operator which has this eigenvalue structure. Um, and the cool thing is since we have that standardized then it's also always easy to compare and also easy to show people how it works because you can just look at this aspect isolated. You don't need to think about how this qubit encoding works, for example, if you wanna implement something like this. Um, Another example is the so-called separable pair approximations. And there I can draw the connection back to what we were talking about before with this uh, system adaptive approach of discretization, where I told you about the surrogate potential that we have and that we can use the information from this to, to get a feeling if our discretization is physically reasonable or not. But we can do more with this. This actually gives us already information about which types of correlation or excitations are more important than others in the system of interest. And this we can of course exploit if we construct quantum circuits. This is again, this beryllium dihydride system. And if you, I like to use this as an example because here, if you visualize the orbitals, you can, you can directly see the structure, but don't get me wrong. Like the, the structure is automatically determined. Like this is not manually that you plot the orbitals, you look at them and then you draw your circuit. This is what the system automatically gives you back, but here you can really see what happens. You see, if you look at these orbitals here, there are three groups, basically. This is the core orbital, which doesn't do much. And then these two split up into the left and the right bond, basically. And if you split them up into these groups, you are basically using the same thing that chemists use if they draw the formulas where each bond is like a stick between the atoms. And this is the same type of approximation and these orbitals are in the right form in order to let you do that. And now you can construct your circuit in a separated way. So as you see, like these are like three separated blocks which are never connected in some, at some point. And this is the so-called separable pair approximation because each of these blocks describe an individual electron pair in one of these orbital sectors. And the nice thing about this is First, this is a, a high level product structure, so to say. But on the other hand, also each of these individual wave functions, they don't require much memory to represent classically. You actually just require a linear amount of memory, which means these type of circuits are naturally classically simulatable without uh, much effort, which means in the context of uh, VQE, if you see this as a, as a fabric or like a factory, that gives you good initial states to another uh, algorithm you're interested in, now you can do this entirely classically. And so this optimization in, in principle becomes uh, relatively cheap. Of course, you can also think about after you're using this as an initial thing, and then you can also continue with BKE by connecting these pairs and correlating with them. Um, this is just some example of like how many parameters, how many C-naughts and how deep the circuits are for specific molecules. And the second number here is always the number of qubits. So you see like in a lot of cases, uh, the depth doesn't really change because you just get more individual electron pairs, which you can, which you can stack uh, above each other. 
Um, and this is, since we had that example before, this is again like this beryllium dihydride. This is the so-called separated pair approximation. This is the red line here. And you see in some parts, it's like a really good physical approximation. And in some part, of course, um, the system becomes more correlated and this is not enough to describe it. Otherwise, we would always be, we would always be good with these uh, classical chemical intuition uh, that each bond is a stick between the atoms. Um, but in principle, these VQE methods here, which are also, I know it's a bit ugly acronyms, but this is kind of, you can view this as you use this circuit and then you use different excitations between the pairs and then you get a longer circuit. And so you can use this as a starting point in order to reach the point below there. Um, in the very end, uh, since I know that like some of you also like to code and are probably interested in contributing something, these are like some possible extensions you could do with this, which are on a on a high level. So like if you're interested in getting into this, this might be like an interesting thing to explore. So for example, these uh, SPA circuits here, if we look at an individual electron pair, they look like this. And you probably noticed this C0 cascade here. And this is basically a basis change. Here we are moving in a paired space. So like it's not just that the electrons are that it's a pair of electrons but they're also always forced to be in the same orbital so like you don't need the spin degree of freedom if you then use this c0 cascade you are transferring to the jordan wigner picture and in tequila it looks a bit like this we have these transformations and you, they can have a function which is called hcb to me hcb means a uh, hardcore boson this is how these pairing models are called because if you force the electrons to always be in one in one orbital, if you use the second quantization language of this, um, these uh, operators now commute instead of anti-commute. So you can say they kind of behave like bosons. This is where the name comes from. But if you have this function here, you can always transfer to the encoding that you have. So in principle, you can take the bravi kitai encoding, check how does the circuit then, this is also just a bunch of CNOTs that transfers between these two uh, representations. It could also be something that just transfers from Jordan Wigner to the representation you want. So like something that is added here. And this can just be overwritten without like looking at the rest of the code. And with this, it kind of gets more flexible. It's a nice introduction also if you're interested into which I think some of you are uh, into more quasi-local codes, which are not like Jordan Wigner, Bravi Kitaev, but which are more advanced and try to localize the whole description if you map into qubits. Um, of course, we can also explore like the qubit connectivity. If you would look at this circuit, for example, this is how the qubits needs to be connected in order to represent this. And then if you take multiple pairs, like these two, for example, you have two sets of qubit clusters that look like this. And which connections do you need to make in order to get from here to there, for example? Um, and here, this hardcore boson model, there are also other. Uh, papers which are using this in a, in a, in a, in a different context, actually. But um, since the implementation is there, you can get the Hamiltonians and all of this. And this is like maybe an easy access point into that world if you're interested in this. Those are just some suggestions. Uh, and there are some recent developments that happened, uh, which I don't want to go into the detail, but they are nice developments if you're interested how such a framework is used when it's really used as a black box method. So like here, they all use these gradient techniques, these determined orbitals that we talked about, and these SPA circuits that we saw last, really as a black box in order to just to explore different things they were interested in, which had nothing to do with these three topics. Um, which was this was very nice for me because it was kind of an confirmation that the system works. Uh, very end. Um, we have a lot of contributors to Tequila. A lot of people work very hard on this. Um, Abina Fernand was part of the gradient development team, which I showed you, Philip and Tere about the automatic generation of orbitals. Uh, Sumner did a lot of work on Tequila itself on the core library, the same as Alba, but also the same as also these three. And then we have a lot of contributors from our own group, from the Ismailov group, uh, uh, people from all over the world, over GitHub, uh, over the Quantum Open Source Foundation, and uh, 
potentially also you at some point if you are interested in this uh, if this is the case also always feel free to let me know about it or if you have any questions um with this also uh, thank you very much for your attention and uh, the questions you already have yeah wonderful clap 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 let's clap first that was wonderful um Thanks for this overview and um, like this high level overview, but also going into details. Um, I must say I have like a couple of millions of questions, but uh, sorry, I will spare you from them. So I will ask some and, and um, since you're coming around in the near future, we can discuss loads of other things then in detail later and at, at, at the blackboard. But let's have some questions, questions now. I mean, I have surely some, I mean, who, 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 who starts? Um, I have a question. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, this um, this uh, gradient computation in the in the fermionic excitations, uh, the, is the the cost is independent of the number of, of fermions that you have. Uh, the cost for the gradient, yes. Um, but the cost for, if you like, so. If this fermionic excitation, if this is a one, two, three, or four fermionic excitation, the cost changes in the terms of the circuit cost. Like the circuit gets more complicated, and this is why in in the in the total black box automatic differentiation, also your your gradient cost rises like this. But the gradient cost itself does not change anymore if you use this high level thing. But for example, a uh, a double excitation, the circuit of a double excitation is still more expensive than the circuit of a single excitation, but that's something you cannot in that doesn't um, that's something you can't prevent basically. But uh, the gradient cost, so to say, uh, in terms of how many evaluations of the circuit I need to make, this is what's what's going lower. Mm -hmm. And so is the is the is the issue that um, you have? I mean, so if you really just have. For like, can I understand this as four expectation values that I need to evaluate? For instance, this number. Yeah, exactly. Four. This is this is exactly what it is. Yeah. And then does this mean um, I I essentially only have two free parameters that I want to optimize? Oh oh oh. Okay, I get the question. Um, okay, this is a bit simplified. This is the gradient cost for a single excitation. So each of these, so like you're building up your, your, your circuit with a lot of these excitations and each of these excitations have, a, have an angle associated to it. So this is the gradient cost for each of the, for a single excitation. So if you have, <laughs> let's say you have, if you have N of those excitations, different types. So we have N parameters. So in the complex case, if you want to evaluate all the gradients of all these parameters, it's n times four. Yeah. yeah. So in a sense, it's uh, if you have real wave functions, this is reduced to two. And this is, I usually, I, I like to compare this because that's also the same comparison holds true for the original shift rule. If you compare that with finite differences, that's the same cost. Yeah. Because finite differences, like you have to do two evaluations of the same objects like shifted to the left and right. And that's, that's comparable there. Mm -hmm. yeah yeah okay thanks yeah yeah also on this on on, on the slide like i have a, like a more like a philosophical comment and, the, and and an actual question the philosophical comment is like i mean of course here you have the gradient cost for the n electron excitation and so on but i mean most of the time when it's like really interested in the in the low energy subspaces in in all of this whereas um in in the actual quantum chemistry context, one is of course interested in like high temperature settings. Although whenever I talk to quantum chemists, they say that's fine. We learn something about the dynamics of the of the problem by looking at the low energy subspaces. But never mind. So um, at, at some point we could discuss the 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 impact of the like, ground state properties to understanding dynamics in one way. But maybe not. That's not for today. But my concrete question is: in in, in this setting, you have like enormously large spaces that you need to um, assess when you want to estimate gradients either way from data or even in your um, high level um, simulation on the, on, on the computer. And I was wondering, I mean, this could be sim simplified if there was a lot of structure in the problem. And we've been discussing this a bit um, also in, in, in the group to what extent like sparse structures or low rank structures in the, in the, in the gradient could help because then you could do matrix completion or sparse sampling techniques, compressed sensing techniques. Um, is that, I mean, 
what structure do you see there? Is there something that could be exploited or is that rather structureless? Um, so you're talking about um, if you are estimating these gradients by measurement, like yeah. reducing this? No, no, even without, I mean, just the, how, how does the gradient look like? Set up the gradient and then what's there? Is that really sparse? Um, sparse in which, in which context? Well, they're just, I mean, are, are many entries pretty small? Uh, in general, it's hard because it, it, it really depends on, like, if you're talking about such a circuit gradient with respect to a parameter, it depends on how the rest of the circuit looks. So it's, you have kind of the structure in like the, if you build up those things in the very beginning, um, since they are often like rotating in some subspaces. Uh, some of these are not occupied yet, and then the grading gets simpler. Um, yeah. But I'm, that's really hard to say. Uh, okay, no, no, this was also more. I mean, I have something mathematical to say about this, but my question to you was more on a on a of a heuristic type, like asking what your experience is, like how these these dudes often look like. Okay, well, yeah, we can discuss this. It's, it's really hard to say, like also from from heuristics experience. Like I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't dare to make a prediction, actually. Mm -hmm. And when you compare the, the, the quantum setting with the classical setting, I mean, of course, my, I mean, some of the stuff you mentioned, like also on the on the orbitals earlier, um, is, as you said yourself, it would also work for DFT and also for tensor network methods equally well. And also picking up that theme, I mean, you also mentioned that um, some settings are classically simulated, but then there's some regimes where this is interesting for variation quantum problems and others where this is not so interesting and we had a similar problem like with paul and 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 and, and others and, and richard also richard Kung and so on and and marika um and, and and mark when we thought about quantum simulation techniques where we had like cool new methods of um sparse sampling to do quantum simulation including quantum chemistry problems for that matter that would tackle dynamics but for rather short times and then the question was arising in what regimes we can expect these guys to be particularly good over classical methods. Because for these short and intermediate times, like tensor network methods can work quite well if the Hamiltonian is pretty local, in particular if it's geometrically local. I mean, there's even theorems on that. So, um, so there's kind of, there's settings where one has to add, well, there's settings where quantum methods make more sense than others because sometimes classical methods are already pretty good. So, to cut a long story short, do you have an intuition like when your methods are like state of the art and when you just say, that's great, it's good to know, but stick to your classical methods? Do you have like an um, understanding? Yeah, I mean, for these, for these chemistry problems, at least like um, a lot of the, uh, a lot of the demonstration nowadays are mostly uh, kind of organic molecules. And there we have a pretty good intuition. Actually. But the intuition is always the equilibrium state of the, of the nuclear framework that determines the molecule. There you are almost always pretty good with the classical methods. Mm -hmm. um, and with classical methods, I mean something like couple cluster single stubbles. Um, mm -hmm. This is also something um, we had in this small plot here. Like you see, this is this equilibrium distance of these two bonds here and at this regime um there's no real classical method here but these sba is basically classically simulatable this is basically a classical method this works very well here and you can't really distinguish it from the others because the correlation is very low mm -hmm. at this point um the uh the um the philosophical explanation is basically here like this this chemical picture of drawing the molecule like this holds true while at this point here actually the picture breaks down completely because here you have isolated atoms but here it's actually at this point it's not the method that breaks down but it's our surrogate model we don't have the best orbitals if we now to if we now restructure the orbitals here we can actually get down to that point so this is also then clear that we can tackle this and it's also clear from physical principles we can kind of understand that here i would i would still say it's like more of a heuristic thing um because these the 
the picture that we have in mind kind of holds here. The system really behaves like this. It's like two fairly individual bonds. Of course, there is like spatial overlap between those. Like in space, it's not it's not two sticks, but you can you can you can visually see the picture here that it's true. And then it's usually at these intermediate regimes and like for chemical reaction, that's often so-called transition states, which are points of interest, but they're not equilibrium structures, but you need to know them in order to estimate reaction energies. Mm -hmm. In this picture, there's no equivalent of a transition state, but um, okay, it's like here, it would be this, if, if you see like the, if you see this as a reaction, um, so, Often like in reaction, it's like this, it goes up here and then it goes down. And then the highest point is the transition state. Mm -hmm. And there it's often that these, um, that you have more correlation, so to say, because the, the picture breaks down a bit. Mm -hmm. It's actually, um, this is very heuristic, all of this. And it's like, um, there are some, some ways how you can capture this and also like some recommendation systems, but I would say you can't say for sure. Okay. But uh, no, no, that's that's that feeling type of thing. Yeah, wonderful. Um, yeah. Um, any other questions? Yeah. I mean, I have yeah, one... lots, but I will I will ask most when you are here. But um, I have one more that I ask. But Johannes first. Yeah. Um, I mean, in in those uh, ansatz constructions for those quantum chemistry problems, I mean. I guess like this, uh, ex you put those excitations, this is kind of the state, of, as the first question, is this kind of the state of the art to make good answers for those chemistry problems? Um, um, I, I didn't, it, it didn't like, it didn't receive, was received completely here in Toronto. Um, you meant like, what is the state of the art or? Like this uh, um, up or this like, I mean, using those, excitations to couple cluster i mean like those things as building blocks for your ansätze is so if this is the state of the art or i mean was how would you build like a good ansatz for these kinds of problems oh yeah okay okay uh, got it um so it's kind of um state of the art in a sense that if you use these building principles you're operating in the in the subspaces of your uh many body configurations which you want to be in so for example if you use the second quantized method you have for uh, let's say you have 10 electrons in the system it means all your excitations all, all your co individual contributions to your qubit wave function always need 10 qubits in the state one and the others all in the state zero so like you always have 10 electrons in the system and all of these others are invalid so like they don't they don't help you in improving your wave function and there are also other things like uh you need as many spin up electrons as spin down electrons or depending on which type of uh, spin state you want in the end. If you're using these um, couple cluster type excitations, um, you are guaranteeing that you are never leaving this sector. Of course, you could think in, in principle, there might be like a shortcut if you leave the sector and enter it back at another point, which was, I think a lot of these hardware efficient ansätze, um, this was kind of something people hoped for, I think, it hasn't been really shown in the in the chemistry sentence sense. Uh, it was usually if you use these physical principles to build your circuit, you are often better. But then you can make approximations to this. So for example, this is the small p here. The p says pair and the pair refers to the d. So it's paired doubles. So it means you take all the singles rotations that you can have, but you don't take all the possible doubles rotations. You always like force the double excitations to originate from the same orbital. And this is some approximation that you can make. People make this because the, the circuits you get are way smaller than if you use um, all types of double excitations. And you can do further approximations to this. And I think I have, I have said it actually somewhere. Yeah, for example, in this paper here, um, this is actually the main thing they developed. This is a so-called uh, gate fabric where they're trying to combine these like layered structures of uh, machine learning approaches uh, with uh, the symmetry constraints given by these fermionic excitations, but they don't use the exact fermionic excitations, but in a lot of cases, like approximations to it, for example, I think they also just use the paired doubles and then they, for the singles, they do uh, further approximations where they say we are not 
uh, including all these uh, Z terms, for example, that come from the um, anti-symmetry of the fermions, but instead we are neglecting them, but making each in like making each parameter individual so like that our that we can get around this by variational principle but we have less gates this is in, in a very nutshell basically but it's similar principle they basically also say very clearly like um you need to respect these symmetry constraints otherwise you are in trouble um this is what i would say from a gut feeling is something you have to follow in the ansatz construction i mean the, the, the uh, I paper you mentioned oh I mean, this is also echoing like what we see in our discussions on our side when we talk about like ansets and constructions, like you have to put in some structure, some knowledge about your system, otherwise you're more or less doomed. And looking forward to talking uh, with you about this with somebody who's way, way more informed on like this uh, actual quantum chemistry that yes. analyzes those problems. With this thing, there's also, there's one small slip up that I also like uh, had at some point. You see, for example, here, we use this highly structured SPA thing and it, it works very well in this region here. If you would use something like an adaptive ansatz or for example, also this couple cluster thing, they also work well here and they also converge very well. For example, do an adaptive approach, you will find this like very rapidly. You don't need much screening and you don't need a large operator pool. But at this point here, it gets then heavier and also these two, for them, it gets harder to converge all of a sudden. Like it's not just straight down the hill. Here it's always, you start from mean field. It's just, you go down in a few iterations and you're done. Here it gets more complicated. Also the initialization and all of this. And I think, especially in the beginning, it was often overlooked because people could only do very small systems. And then they did often did the hydrogen molecule and the lithium hydride. And the problem is they both behave like this entirely because um, the hydrogen molecule is literally a two electron system. So this can literally be described by a separated pair approach because it's only one pair. And the lithium hydride, it's technically a four electron system, but two of these electrons are in an orbital like this and they don't really interact with the rest. So you have effectively also a two electron system. And so it was, in the beginning, there were a lot of works were done on these two systems and a lot of these approaches, for example, hardware efficient or other type of heuristic uh, machine learning type approaches worked well, very well there because they could capture the structure, but it's, it doesn't really transfer. And this is why like currently it, it's changing a bit that you need to, you need to do like a UCC type of circuit. So what a lot of people are trying, you want to have a unitary couple cluster circuit, but you don't want to pay the cost of a unitary couple cluster circuit. So you're trying to approximate this and mm -hmm. trying to figure out which of these things can I neglect um, in order to gain something. Yeah, cool, oh, thanks. Wonderful, that's, that's great. I mean, that's more surely a, a, a topic to discuss more um, um, uh, later. And that also resonates uh, uh, very nicely with our thoughts on like what answer, what, what answers they can be in how, uh, how well it can work when you um, use too little information. Also this article by David Zwierich, you mentioned on, on the right-hand side. I mean, that's also like some ansatz that um, tries to make the use of the best uh, locally available knowledge that you have about symmetries and the problem and so on. Um, yeah, 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 exactly. Um, I think um, the uh, Rob Paris, which was also part. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's in like some of these, he, he recently gave a talk in Toronto in this QRST series. Like this is also on YouTube. Like if yeah, 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 someone yeah. is interested, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's one. I'm also quite close to, I mean, you know, Christian Gugli was my student and I'm talking to him a lot about these, these matters. Oh um, yeah, yeah, he's also part of that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, maybe a last question from my side um, because I have more and more, but I mean, for the, for reasons of, being nice to the to the audience, we can keep it at, at bay and then discuss a lot more on the blackboard. But um, I mean, in 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 all this, of course, there's this like Fermi to spin mapping issue that you have also mentioned. I mean, you can just do plain vanilla Jordan Wigner, but there's all the also these more sophisticated Spravi Kitaev and whatnot um, settings. You even mentioned that Whitfield had had, had an approach. There's the one also by 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 um, Fastrate and Sirac that's good for the low energy subspace, which is kind of cute because it's not a full mapping, but it's rather a subspace mapping, a, a, a cute idea. But more along the lines of like what like 
on the power type or so. I mean, thinking of like, well, if you want tensor types or, or so, but I mean, ultimately, there's no need to have a fixed order of fermionic modes along the way. I've not never seen any approach that kind of dynamically assigns orders and orbitals and do that. That's like a, a kind of dynamical Jordan Wigner on, on the fly. Is that something people pursue? Or is that, um, I mean, not have a fixed map altogether, but just, I mean, on the fly, like optimize your variation quantum circuit according to knowledge you have about your system, a bit like an adaptive VQE scheme. Is that something that people look at? You can also discuss um, this. In not in the encoding context. I mean, these, for example, the, the adaptive circuit construction goes a bit in that direction because it's also gradient based. So it's also always local knowledge. Yeah. Um, then these SPAs here are, so to say, the, the other way around, like you're starting with the local knowledge that you already have. Um, but I, I'm not aware of anything that relates this to the, to the qubit encoding. Um, no, not, not even remotely, but there always might always be that there is something like this because it's, it's really hard to keep overview, but, um, oh, yeah. if no one in this audience knows it, then probably not. Yeah, I, I've not seen this. I mean, I, I actually the same, I, I, I raised the, um, the topic in, a, the same question in a highly educated audience, like not long ago. And, and it's also people didn't quite know about it. So yeah. Okay. Interesting. Wonderful. Yeah, yeah, that's 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 great. Um, extremely inspiring. Thank you very much indeed. Um, good. So, um, yeah, there's a lot more to ask. Maybe we shift the long blackboard discussions to soon to the actual blackboard, and let's follow up on on this in a in a in a like more one by one session. But oh, that's already a, a wonderful teaser and um, very inspirational uh, showcase of, of, of your ideas. Thanks so much for this. That was great. And thanks also for the many good questions we had. So to the, to the audience, thanks for coming in. And um, yeah, so I think with this, I, I thank you very much. We catch up one-on-one -on -one very soon and then we, we arrange for everything else. Um, so I, I made a list of other things I want to discuss with you, but that's for another day. Oh yeah, L looking forward, yeah. Yeah, wonderful.